Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside the Borough, uh, the FAU podcast for and by fans. My name is Dan, known as FAU for show on the FAUalvesnest.com forum. I'm here with Jack and Aaron as always, and today uh, we're going to dig into uh, a couple things. We're going to see if we can digest the the Buffalo loss, uh, and then we'll, we've got uh, we've got some special guests with us uh, coming up a little bit later in the show, and then we'll we'll dig into. Um, we'll dig into Charlotte. So, guys, this was this was another one of those one of those losses, which kind of seems like all of our losses, where you just want to bang your head against the ground uh, or faint uh, because of the because of the, the noon uh, start time. But FAU lost. What was, what was the final score? Thirty three to fifteen uh, with five turnovers. I think it was. Uh, so it was it was a tough. Uh, it was really a tough – it was a tough day to be an Owl fan, man, that's for sure. Yeah, it definitely was. But if you look at it, though, Buffalo's points all came on offensive turnovers. Our defense, again, proved that they're playing at a level with a lot of very young players, true freshmen, redshirt freshmen, very young players that haven't been in the system one or in their second year learning it. They stopped Buffalo multiple times, allowed only one offensive uh, touchdown on a regular drive. The rest of the time was either they forced a punt, uh, a field goal, made key stops. But then people are going to say, well, then they couldn't make the like, stop in the fourth quarter when Buffalo was driving down the field. You look at it, they were on the field for over, I want to say over half the time in the second half. So no matter how well conditioned you are, no matter – how great of shape you're in. You're out there that much after your offense constantly turns over the ball. You're going to be gassed. You're going to basically run out energy. So, but they played extremely well, considering. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys kind of just touched on it a little bit earlier. It's just the game was just demoralizing, really. I mean, being out there in the heat, getting sunburned. I got a pretty nice tan out of it. That's really about it. Um, it was tough to sleep that night. Um, it was just demoralizing. I mean, you're, you're literally drained from the um, heat of the game. You're sweating like crazy. Um, you're sweating like crazy. Uh, it's just, just not comfortable. And then you see what's going on on the field, and it's just a complete mess. Yeah, and I think that's – it's it's just it's another one of those games where again it's it's just so frustrating. Um, you know, we could go on and on about how awful having a, a noon game is and and how stupid it is to have a noon game in September in South Florida. Um, but it's just seeing when like when you step back, you're like, oh man, we lost by twenty something points. But it's like like Aaron said, there was only when you break it down, there was the three three touchdowns were direct results. Uh, of the offense, a pick six and two fumbles returned for a touchdown. And then there was one field goal that was given up after another fumble that uh, they went down to, what, the three or four-yard line and the defense held them out. And then there was a safety. Um, so it's like the, what's unfortunate is, like, we can never be consistent. Like in Tulsa, we put up a ton of points, um, but we couldn't stop anything. And then against Miami, Miami was Miami. I mean, we did okay until we started turning, turning the ball over and Miami made adjustments. <clears throat> And then with Buffalo, the defense played played the defense played more than good enough for us to win the game. Um, it was just the offense. Just I mean, we, we could have. If when you think about it, if we uh, because they only scored one defense or one offensive touchdown, if we didn't turn the ball over once, we could have won the game nine to seven. <laughs> you know, like that's that's just. That's what's really frustrating with me. And then I, I looked up some some uh, uh, stats on where we are with fumbles and things like that. Uh, and, and the two things uh, that really are really the biggest thing I'll talk about right now is the turnover. We are – in turnover margin, we are tied for 116th in turnover margin with in minus five. Um, it's like, you know, with – we're not going to lose – we're not going to win many games with um, – with that many turnovers, having that many turnovers. Um, and we probably we probably would be worse if it weren't for the Tulsa game where we had uh, four, um, four of our own turnovers. So it's been – it was just, just a, an unbelievably frustrating, unbelievably frustrating. 
Yeah, I mean, that was the one thing that got me besides <laughs> the heat of uh, was the turnovers. I mean, Driscoll, again, first half, did extremely well as a quarterback. You know, made the throws, made adjustments. Brian Wright made the guy a little bit too cute inside the red zone there with the throwback, throwback. But he did well. Second half comes around, Buffalo makes adjustments. FAU failed to, to adjust to those adjustments, and they start turning the ball over. Warren and Howe both fumbling. And I know when Coach Partridge was on the show, they basically said, we're working on ball security. We got this rope thing. Well, guess what, Coach? I think you need to go back to the rope thing and try stripping the ball out of the running back's hands again. Because we cannot – down the road, we're playing – in the next three weeks, we're playing – four weeks. Charlotte, Rice, and Marshall. Two teams – Two of those teams, you definitely don't want to turn the ball over against. So, oh, all of them, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, all, all, all of them would be good, yeah, to not turn the ball over. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy that you know we double the amount of yardage that Charlotte has. We had 500 yards; they have about 220, and they double the amount of points that we have, 33 to 15. That's just crazy. It's asinine to think, really. It's and it's like this against Tulsa, and and I. Um, I don't remember if I, if I said this during the Tulsa game or during the, the Tulsa recap, but um, I asked uh, Tim Reynolds, one of the writer for the for the I was going to say for the UP for the AP, about um, we had we had four turnovers, uh, scored forty points, did not uh, did not have any turnovers, and we still lost the game. And I I, I said he, he a lot of times he's good with those kind of really weird stats, and I said. When was the last time a team scored 40 points, had four turnovers, uh, caused four turnovers, and had zero themselves and did not win the game? And he couldn't find any time that it happened. So we are, I mean, we are literally inventing ways uh, to lose games when we should be winning them. And just like with this, you know, doubling the amount of, uh, doubling the amount of uh, yards that Buffalo had and, and they're doubling our score. Like, that's just, a, it's a new way to lose. It's unbelievable. So... Um, yeah, so we are going to, uh, no, we'll kind of move on from Buffalo and, uh, we're going to invite some, uh, we've got some two new people, uh, for the show, not necessarily new to the show, but, uh, definitely not new to the forum. Uh, they're going to come on and, um, and do a little debate, have a little fun, uh, this time. So here we've got, uh, Owl Country 40. And uh, Walty12 are going to come on and um, share a little thoughts with us. So uh, to get started, we'll, uh, we'll kind of do, do a couple things here. But to get started, we'll talk about really the status, the state of the program, uh, state of the program right now. So we're about a quarter, uh, a quarter of the way into the season. We are currently 0-3 with the most talented team uh, that FAU's ever had. Uh, and so now we just kind of want to hear what – uh, what Walty and OC40 uh, have to say. So uh, take it away, guys. All right, you know, you know, I'll start first. I'm the infamous Owl Country 40. I know I know many of you on the board, and this is the first time uh, you guys see my face. Um, you know, at least I'm on here. I know there's some uh, guests on the board who would uh, never go out and show their opinions. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just – you know, my biggest frustration is, you know, just the way this coaching staff speaks and sometimes, you know, speaks to the program. As someone who's watched college football uh, since before they can walk, uh, to me, I've heard all these pitches before. And my biggest frustration is seen on the board is just there's just this still this hope that, you know, oh, it, you know, so far it hasn't changed from year one to year two. But, I, you know, I feel like it's going to change from year two to year three. And um, as I posted back in August, and I kind of wanted to get, that, get this out there early, is this success that so many second-year coaches have around the country, especially at uh, G5 programs where, you know, it's, it's not like trying to turn an SEC West program around, uh, which, you know, Brett Bielema is uh, struggling a lot with right now. Um, you know, Skip Holtz is an example of that, who had in his second year had Louisiana Tech, uh, you know, going to the Conference USA Championship game. Uh, Charlie Partridge is now this year 0-2 versus first-year head coaches. Uh, Lance Leopold, the coach who beat him uh, this week, 
Um, I, you know, I made the comparison. This is a first year head coach. He took over a Buffalo program that went five and six last year. They had one game canceled. Um, their coach the year before uh, last year was fired in mid season as well. Um, I don't know if that sounds familiar. And he's taken over a program that has a senior quarterback, uh, very similar to the program that Charlie took over. Uh, we'll see where Buffalo season finishes, but uh, it's frustrating to see him have immediate success. And we're still hearing, you know, the win today mantra, which in a couple of weeks, it's going to be uh, 365 days without a win today. Right. So th this is Walty 12. Uh, I come on as a uh, FAU alum and I'm on the board a lot, as people know, kind of giving my opinions. Um, so the, the preface of this conversation was that this is the most talented team FAU's ever had. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, my take in college football is that upperclassmen and the talent that lies with the juniors and seniors is usually what dictates the success of a program. Uh, our seniors right now were recruited during a 1-11 in season, which was Howard's last. Our juniors were recruited by uh, a guy who uh, had some infamous off-the-field uh, issues and, uh, and brought a lot of JUCO guys in that have now moved on. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, to, to kind of counter what OC40 is saying, in my opinion, is we hired Charlie because we wanted to do a few things. And one of those things we wanted to do was strengthen recruiting ties and coaching relationships down here in South Florida. So... Mind you, we hired a defensive coach. So he's, he has promised to deliver on recruiting and strengthen those relationships, and he's come through on both of those. To defend the start at 0-3 obviously is tough, and the end of last year makes it even tougher. However, we started the season at Tulsa, which at the time was a devastating loss. It was a hard loss to watch because of the way the game went. You know, we started off down 21-7, came back, took a 10-point lead, and lost in overtime. Well, when I went on the board, everybody's opinion was that Tulsa is not a very good team. Well, ever, since, since that moment, they went and drummed New Mexico and put up over 650 yards. Then they went into Norman last Saturday where their quarterback threw for 460 yards and four touchdowns. Their top wide receiver had 190 yards and two touchdowns against Oklahoma. And they lit it up again. So that loss, while it was tough to take and tough to watch, I think – you can look back on it and look at what they've done since and kind of understand the team we were playing on the road. Then there was the Miami game. Now, the Miami game was obviously a tough game. I, I mean, I think, you know, they had more talent than we do. I think it was apparent while watching the game. We hung in there in the first half. But while hanging in there, we lost our fifth-year starting quarterback. We lost our explosive running back in Jay Warren. And in the second half, we didn't look so great. So then we come into the Buffalo game, missing our fifth-year quarterback, playing a an, what looked to me to be a not-ready-to-play because of injury, Jay Warren, who I, I think the, – well, I could say it's because he's injured. That's he laid the, the ball coaches. down the way he did. Uh, right. Well, yeah, it is. But, I mean, it's not on the coaches that are starting – you know, our fifth-year starting quarterback was out of the game and we were starting a freshman – you know, that, that, and then – Hold on. That point frustrates me. And Partridge, one of the things that frustrated me, the first thing he got on, he got on the podium after the game. He goes, oh, Driscoll, look like a freshman. Well, let's use freshman in different terms. He's a redshirt freshman. Huge difference. He's not new to campus. And he also early enrolled. Uh, he has now been on FAU's campus and with the program for 20 months. Uh, not expecting mm -hmm. this from Driscoll, but there is guys who have won the Heisman who has spent less time on campus than Driscoll has. I think he can go out there, manage a game, and uh, beat Buffalo, a team which uh, the person that was sitting next to me for most of the game uh, said the most frustrating part is if you look at Buffalo, there was not a single player on that team who I would pick over any of our players, just based on pure talent, size, speed. Uh, it's it's the, You're right, the Tulsa uh, – game that the team had some talented some really talented players buffalo did not uh and they whooped us in that second half just physically whooped us and if you want to say the defense played well um yeah maybe they're on the field a lot but you know buffalo took a 
I believe it was seven, eight minute drive. Um, and they missed a field goal at the end of this drive, but still they drained a ton of clock uh, in our home, um, in our weather uh, at the end of that game. It, it's that, right. it's just so flustered. We have bigger, stronger, faster players than us, and a D line that Charlie again on the coaches show today talked up, saying how oh we have ten of these guys that can play. Well, um, the nine minute drives against uh, teams with the talent as Buffalo should not happen. Right, and the, well, the second you're right. The second half of that Buffalo game was ugly, and we looked worn down. And I don't know if it was a mix of us being, you know, the, the irony is they were playing in South Florida where the heat's supposed to be at our advantage. I don't know if it was we got worn down, or I don't know if it was because of the, the, the fumbles and pick sixes kind of, you know, deflating the team. I, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know this. At the end of the first half, our offense had 340 yards to Buffalo's 110, and we were winning 9-7. to seven. Now, our offense is – coordinated by Brian Wright, who a lot of people backed as should be the head coach. Well, if you gain over 350 yards and you have nine points, that's a problem. And I thought a play calling was a problem. I thought there was some instances, I, uh, specifically a, a, you know, a fourth and one, we're in an empty backfield with our scat back kind of spread out and throwing the ball, not to mention we throw the ball, threw the ball 55 times on the shoulders of a redshirt freshman. And, and that's not Charlie's call. That's not Charlie's call. That's Brian Rice's call. He managed the game. That's, that's, that's on the head coach. I mean, we well, we were ultimately, it always, it ultimately, it ultimately, it always is. So I can't, I, can't, I can't stick up for him in that way. But I can say this. When it comes to Charlie, the argument you kind of have, which I understand what you're saying, you want immediate results and you want them now. And the same, uh, it's, same old, same old. Immediate, this isn't immediate results. We're 15 games into this. And it's not even – there's not even signs. We are losing the same way we lost to Wyoming last year. You know, you know people uh, – instead, you know, the, I, I started to lose a little bit of faith in Charlie. Um, I'm a big person. When I watch the game, the kind of in-game situations are the things that I pay most attention to. The coach. When they use timeouts, how kind of their clock management is. But, um, well, but you know, see, let, me just, let me just say this. We both, we both agree this, I think. Charlie is not here because he's a great X's and O's coach. Charlie's here because he's a great recruiter. So here's what I'm saying. If you're going to hire a guy, if you're going to hire a guy who's going to win on talent, you have to let that talent grow up. All right. So we're going to try to move into uh, – look forward to Charlotte now – um, definitely a winnable game. Charlotte is making the transition from uh, into a uh, full-time FBS member. Um, they have their first uh, Division One uh, Division One win against Georgia State earlier in the year. Um, but this is again this this is a team that there should be absolutely no problem with FAU beating. Um, but you know Buffalo it was the same. Uh, was the same as that. So we'll see what happens. The line is currently it's, – it's been kind of funky um, the whole week. I think in the beginning it had Buffalo um, Buffalo favored by seven, and now the line I think is what we just looked up. Depending on, on where you're looking, it's anywhere from um, FAU's favor to win by seven, and there's pretty uh, pretty large consensus that it should be a double-digit victory for FAU. I think it's because Vegas is probably counting on Quest being back, which – we're hoping um, – so it should be – again, this should be a game that FAU wins. That, that's, that's all there is to it. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of question marks there. Um, this Charlotte team uh, hosting FAU reminds me a lot to a point of when we hosted UM a couple weeks ago uh, in a sense that the crowd is going to be, you know, pretty rambunctious for this game. They're going to be very excited. It's going to be a sellout. Uh, there's 15,000 seat stadium, beautiful little venue that they have there in their beautiful campus. Um, their very first night game in program history, they just installed some lights. It's their very first home conference USA game in program history. A lot of firsts. Let's hope it's also not first conference USA win on top of that. Um, they have a, some question marks at uh, quarterback position, Charlotte Observer uh, and Steve Little just reported that their head coach, uh, Phil Lambert, 
um, announced that Lee McNeil, who was their third string quarterback going into the year, might start. Uh, they just lost, you know, 70 something to 14 at Middle Tennessee last week. So they definitely do need a little shakeup. Uh, you have another guy, Johnson, who started against Georgia State, did fairly well, as well as they could in their very first FBS game. Uh, another guy, uh, Brooks Barden, uh, who came in a little bit uh, during Presbyterian in Middle Tennessee. Um, but it seems like the offense has really just slowed down or looking for something to spark it. Uh, they have a young offensive line, a uh, solid group of receivers. Um, but, I mean, as you said, Dan, this is one of those games where there really is no excuses for turnovers. There really is no excuses for not putting points on the board. Uh, no matter which quarterback they put out there, I'm very confident in our defense, especially as they've shown, you know, in the first half of the UM game and with the last week's Buffalo game, that they should be able to uh, meet this challenge. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, the, the biggest thing, um, you know, as far as keys for the game, I'm, it's basically – what the keys for the game, and this will be the keys for the game for the rest of the year, um, for the most part, is don't is don't beat ourselves. I mean, we are, um, like I mentioned, with turnovers, we're tied for 116th with penalties. Um, what were we? We're we're tied for 112th in most penalties per game. Um, so it's like those those two. If you combine the penalties being in the bottom four or five in, in turnovers lost and bottom four or five in uh, penalties, you're not going to win many games. So for me, um, that, that, that's it. I mean, you can't, especially in these type of, and we've been in these type of games, turnovers can be, um, uh, can, can get momentum going and, and thinking the other team can win, which is basically, you know, kind of what happened with us in Miami. If we take care of the ball, if we take care of the ball and we're disciplined on offensive and defense, we don't uh, um, we don't have many many penalties. I don't think this game is going to be close, no matter who starts at quarterback, um, whether it's Driscoll or Quez. Hopefully, it's Quez. But um, as long as Driscoll doesn't throw for a record number of times, um, you know, it's, and we don't even need and you know if if Jay Warren's still injured, which it, you know whatever's wrong with him, it's it's, if it's ribs or you know whatever it is um we just need a we in order to win this game we need a serviceable serviceable running back we need somebody that's going to run the ball and hold on to it for four or five yards and that's it um so i don't know Th those are those are my keys i guess uh i'm gonna echo the same thing no turnovers uh i think last game we only had five or seven penalties i mean that seems like a lot but you know they Penalties do kill drives. Uh, but turnovers, turnovers, turnovers have been our downfall so far this season. And it's – one, it does come down to holding on the ball when running through the line. Hal showed last week and Warren showed. Uh, they're, either they were running with their arms loose or they weren't holding on to the ball, running through the line, you know, tight as they could. But you got to hang on the ball. You gotta keep the def our defense off the field, uh, so they're rested, and you gotta put up points. Yeah, I'm just I'm just praying that Quez, you know, is feeling a lot better and he can go. I mean, I just think our offense is so much more dynamic with him in it. Um, they know that we're not gonna run the ball every single time, or they know that you know Driscoll's is not gonna stay in the pocket if we do throw it. Um, so you know, we could just you know back off. It's I just feel much more comfortable with Quez back there. I think if Driscoll's back there, I am going to be a bit worried, especially if the turnover bug starts coming around. We allow Charlotte to stay in the game. I'm going to be very, very worried. And I just, you know, that's because I don't really have a lot of confidence in the team right now. Um, yeah. But unless, unless we have that, you know, senior leadership that Quez has or that Quez brings uh, and those things kind of happen and he's there to, you know, make sure the team is focused, make sure, you know, we just maintain our game plan then I will feel a little more comfortable if the turnover bug returns. Um, yeah. But I, I, I prefer the turnover bug just not return at all. So how about we, you know, work on that and see how that works out. Yeah, this – and I'll kind of finish up with this. This this is a good opportunity for FU to get its first road win in, what, since USF in 2012 was our, our last – or was that 2013? Was that was our last road win, maybe? I, I, that was an awesome win. That yeah, was a great time. Um, great time. <laughs> but um, here, here's one thing that I would, I would keep an eye out is, and this drives me 
freaking crazy is whenever we have a big play and then we run up to the line and we try to run this like hurry up thing to get things going down the field every single time we either fall start or against Tulsa there was the too many men in the backfield penalty when we were right on the goal line um, that drives me nuts because we cannot run that and I don't think there's any purpose in doing that um, I think it's 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 like uh, Brian Wright will not let that play go. He won't let that. It, you know, we we have a thirty, you know, thirty yard play or something like that. They all run up to the line trying to get set before the defense can get set, and nobody is set, and we always end up getting a penalty or the play doesn't run correctly. Um, I think last last time that was the the interception that um, was thrown into the end zone. I think that was that was off of that type of play. Um, so that's one thing I would watch. To see if we do that, to see are we successful or is it going to be another false start, whatever it is. So um, I, would, I would watch out for that because it just drives me up the wall when you do that. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, at some points, I know you were, they wanted to run the hurry-up spread, but at some points, it's not also that bad to kind of milk the clock a little bit, you know, slow down tempo a little bit too. So Yeah. I, mean, I, I love the hurry-up spread. I love the fast pace. I love utilizing our speed. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, against you guys there a little bit. But then you have a point, as long as we can do it penalty-free. Right. I, I, think, exactly. I think that's the key. If, if we can't do it penalty-free, then don't do it. Um, and, we, and we haven't shown that we could do it. And, and we've yeah. been three games, and every time we try to do it, there's a penalty. So it's just like, let's either do it with no penalties or don't do it. Yeah. I'm 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 on that boat, but I mean, once once we can get it uh, penalty free, uh, that thing is going to be fun to watch, and it's going to be deadly with our speed. It really yeah. will, especially when we're playing. You know, these non Florida schools, non you know Southern schools like Buffalo would have been a great opportunity to uh, run that yeah. uh, with great precision with Quez back there. And you know, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, I think that will wrap it up uh, for this week. Again, thanks uh, for OC40 and Walty uh, for joining us and being part of the show. And we look forward to, um, uh, to maybe having them on again. And uh, as always, uh, thanks, Jack and Aaron. And uh, as always, always, uh, we'll see you next time. And go Owls. Please, God, beat Charlotte, please. <laughs>